Welcome to the Sales Podcast, Session 66. It's time to get mobile and leave corporate behind. Welcome to the 66th edition of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we've got Mr. Greg Hickman. He has a great story whereby he was still an employee and following his passion. He was fortunate enough to have a great employer that was uh, helping him do that. And his passion was around mobile marketing. And as he became a guru with that, with his company, he began building his business on the side, working nights and weekends, which uh, we'll talk about. And he was able to uh, build a nest egg, make a plan, and leave corporate behind. Now he's got a successful blog, a successful podcast of his own, uh, consulting business around not only mobile marketing, but just marketing in general and entrepreneurship. So I think you'll enjoy this podcast. Today's joke, it pertains to marketing. It's not so much a joke as an ad I actually ran across for a hotel that said, the hotel has bowling alleys, tennis courts, comfortable beds, and other athletic facilities. I wonder if that's like a Vegas hotel, you know, when those you put quarters in. But anyway, uh, be careful what you say with uh, the spoken word as well as the written word. It's probably good to have a professional copywriter, maybe like yours truly, help with those written ads. But make sure you have an editor, somebody proofread the things before they go live. Uh, so before we get into the interview, let's jump into the sales podcast creed, which is today is my day. I work diligently towards my goals, which are bigger than me. I bite off more than I can chew because only then will I truly know my current limits and surpassing them becomes my new goal for today. Through education, accountability partners, and bold, decisive action, today will be better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better yet. I'm ready to produce. If you want to show a little love for the podcast, please visit the saleswhisper.com forward slash love and um, got a little click to tweet that'll pop right up. And now... Without further ado, Mr. Greg Hickman. Greg Hickman, leaving corporate, entrepreneur, Colorado. And, uh, dude, uh, you know, wait, okay, wait, hold on a second. I just realized this. You're in Colorado, and yeah. this is just like two weeks after 420. Are, are you Are you okay? <laughs> I'm fine, man. I'm all fine. right, all right. So Greg <laughs> Hickman, um, I will assume non-pot smoker, but hey, you know, it's legal where he is, so don't judge him. Welcome to the sales podcast. How are you? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. So, you and I have some mutual friends in common. One day we'll actually meet. Actually, did we meet in San Diego? Yeah, we did briefly. Yeah, very briefly, standing in the um, in the um, lobby, in the lobby there, right? Hanging yeah. out with John and um, who else was there? A few folks. Rick Mulready was there. At oh the yeah, time. Rick. Uh, yep. Yeah. Very cool. So running in some of the same circles. But for those that don't know you, and I'm just getting to know you. Uh, could you tell everybody a quick thumbnail sketch of your story? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. So got started uh, with my own blog and podcast called Mobile Mixed, um, which is all about incorporating mobile marketing into your marketing strategy uh, in the summer of 2012 and really had no idea what the heck I was doing. <laughs> Did it purely out of selfish reasons, started the podcast to interview people that I thought were doing really cool things in the mobile space. And started building an audience through that. And from that, realized I can start monetizing it and not really having to work for somebody else in, for the long term. So started putting plans in place, networking, you know, going to New Media Expo um, and you know, really connecting with the people that you were just mentioning. And really trying to understand how do I, how do I grow this audience? How do I monetize this audience? And you know, just as of December of 2013, left my corporate job, which... Um, was working for a large retailer uh, in the hunting, fishing, camping space, uh, doing all of their mobile marketing strategy, to now running my blog and my podcast uh, essentially full-time and doing business coaching and mobile marketing training uh, essentially as the, the monetization methods. Very cool. So, so when did you leave corporate America? December 2013. The f December 13th, I think, was my last day. Wow. Very nice. Yeah. So it took you roughly a year and a half um, yeah. to get things to where you could make the leap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that was a mix of that was a mix of a certain revenue coming in and also building up enough savings and, and taking some 
some calculated risks uh, to to essentially manage the risk of, of leaving. So I had some money in savings and you know had some had some recurring revenue. Uh, all right, this is very cool uh, because this is so current for you. And and I very. followed a, a similar journey. You know, I've got a family and. Uh, I was making great money in corporate America. You know, my, my last W-2 was over $180,000 wow. uh, and had a wife. And at the time, we only had six kids. Uh, now we got seven. Wow. Um, and she stayed home for 18 years, you know. But I – so it, it, we did the same thing. I mean, I had to build up savings. It was a calculated risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, but can you walk us through that? Because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners in, in your boat. You know, they're trying to make that transition. They know they want to go out on their own. Uh, but there's there's probably a thousand things that happen you can't plan on, right? Yeah, and, exactly, and, yeah. And the thousand that you do plan on, only 10% of those really work out the way you thought. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so h- how'd you do it? Did, was there a conflict of interest? Did your company kind of lean on you? Did they, did you do it kind of, uh, in the dead of the night, you know? How, yeah. How so n- great question. And, uh, it's funny because, um, before I was only with, uh, Cabela's, which was the retailer I was at for a year. Um, I actually started January of 2013 and quit de- the December, 2013. And I was with another company for about three years prior to that. And, you know, I'd started Mobile Mixed while I was at that job. And, you know, my my boss at the time was really, really awesome about it. He loved what I was doing, was very, very supportive. Um, it got to the point where I was actually working a little bit more on, on that than the, you know, my full-time job. But he was really cool with it just because he he saw the benefit for his company having me be this kind of thought leader in the mobile space uh, that, you know, he could kind of hang his head on as well. From, a, from an experience perspective. Um, and I was ready to, I was pretty close to getting ready to leave that job to take it full time. And actually Cabela's found me through a mutual friend and validated me kind of through my podcast. So, you know, they opened a, an office for their digital marketing team in Denver and they started listening to my podcast, which was obviously on mobile. They were looking for someone to lead their mobile team. They reached out to me. So they knew about the podcast when I started and you know, the person who was responsible for hiring me, you know, I, I kind of laid it out there and said, listen, like, you know, I was ready to kind of take this leap. And, you know, this opportunity does sound really interesting. But if, you know, if this is going to be a problem, you know, meaning me running this podcast, continuing to focus on this, you know, even on the side, then this, it's a showstopper for me. And, you know, he came back and he said, but no, not at all. Like, we love, we love that you're doing this. We think, you know, more people in the, in the company need to be kind of becoming thought leaders and building their authority in their own specific spaces. So they knew up front um, about that whole thing. And he even knew that within a year, year and a half, I was going to potentially leave anyway. Um, but he was more focused on the six months to a year. Um, so I sort of told him like loosely that I was going to give him a year. Coincidentally, he left like six months before I did. Oh. Um, so, so that wasn't too big of a, an issue, but the person that replaced him knew about it. Um, everyone was very, you know, the, the company listened to my podcast. So people knew what was going on. Um, I don't think they knew that I was p- planning on leaving as soon as I did. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was working on it at nights and, you know, outside of, you know, the f- nine to five hours and, you know, that had, you know, po- there was positives to that and there were also negatives. I mean, positives where you had to be as efficient as possible because you had limited time. Um, so, you know, picking the right things wasn't as complicated. Turning down the wrong things wasn't as complicated. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it took a toll on just my mindset, my relationship, uh, my health. You know, I was commuting about 45 minutes each way, um, you know, with no traffic. So, that just it started to wear wear me down a little bit, you know. And I was doing that on the side for you know two and a half years prior, so it was you know working a lot, you know, too much for the most part. And you know, I just knew that I needed to, in order to leave, I needed to have a certain amount of be making a certain amount of money, and I really wanted to be out of debt. I had about twenty or so thousand dollars in credit card debt that I was paying my way out of. Um, and I also felt that there needed to be a certain level of momentum, which I knew was there because it was there before I took the job. You know, I was getting speaking arrangements and stuff like that. All of 2013, I was lining up speaking gigs. I mean, I spoke at New Media Expo, spoke at Social Media Marketing World, 
And it got to the point where, you know, I was just saying yes to everything, like for those types of things. And I said, you know what, when that time comes, I'll figure it out with my employer as to, you know, because they weren't asking me to speak because of Cabela's. I had nothing to do with that. So, um, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm just saying yes. I'm committing to these and, you know, knowing that I will find a way to either be gone by that time or, you know, have some conversation with them saying, listen, I'll, whether it's paid time off or whatever, um, or, you know, don't pay me while I take the day off to go speak. You know, I was ready to kind of figure out whatever I had to do. Um, but one thing that was really important for me was, um, or that became important to my transition was, uh, selling my house. So I had, uh, I had invested in a townhome in 2010, like right near downtown Denver and the market was really, really good. And I saw my neighbor sell his house within 48 hours and do really, really well. And, you know, I shifted my mindset of that house being a long-term investment to, Hmm, well, if I sell this house, I can pay myself out of the remaining debt that I have and still have a safety net to complement the revenue that I'm already bringing in and, you know, have that, that safety net to really lean on in case things go bad. So that's exactly what I did. Sold my house, used the profits to pay off my debt. And I had, you know, I still have a lot of that left over um, in case things go bad. Thankfully, I haven't really had to tap into it too much. Um, but, you know, from there, just kind of figured it out. Like my, my big thing was I was afraid of not being able to pay my mortgage, pay my bills, which I'm sure a lot of people listening can, can relate to. Uh, so I just got rid of my mortgage and I lower, I, I mean, I changed my, my lifestyle. I got a really small one bed, bedroom apartment minimized as much as I could from an, from an, ex, an expense standpoint and, you know, focused on building revenue. Okay. So we're going to have to end this interview now. Cause I, I, I thought you were like working uh, four hours a week and, uh, had a mansion on the beach and, you know, you, you did some tweets and, you know, you got like, <laughs> like 3 trillion followers and you monetize the podcast like in the first month and no, Oh yeah, I should screen my people better. God, where's my <laughs> assistant? Where, where Tanya? I've got to screen these people. Uh, so I mean, that's fantastic, right? Because I mean, I, I had a similar journey. You know, I was I was on my own. I uh, got called up by some old friends. Uh, went back into corporate America. I just it was big money, mm -hmm. and you know, said hey, they knew I had the sales whisperer. I said hey, you know, let's do this for a certain amount of time. Uh, I was ready to go. They asked me to stay on an extra eight months. You know, I'm like finally like, look, I gotta go. You know, but yeah. it was I was working hard. I had two laptops. I had two cell phones. You know, I mean, it was it mm -hmm. was a mess. Uh, but it, I built it up to where I knew I could leave and not disrupt the family actually it was less disruption because they now got me back yeah i'm uh, sure you know so i mean that's a fantastic story um so let's talk about mobile i mean what mm -hmm. what are people doing wrong what should they do right to to leverage mobile to build their business well i mean the first thing is recognize that a majority of your audience is connecting to you from a mobile phone i mean Statistically, you know, depending on where you're at and what industry, I mean, they say 51% of all email opens are happening on a mobile device. You know, over 70% of Facebook and Twitter happens on a mobile device. You know, 61% of podcasts, people, most people listening to this show right now are going to be listening to from listening from their smartphone, you know, streaming, whether they're in their car or, you know, headphones while they're running or working out or doing something they are using the mobile device to listen to this conversation. So, you know, just understanding that the way that your audience and just consumers in general, uh, you know, consume content today is fundamentally different than it was, you know, even three years ago. And, you know, it's going to continue to change with all the different devices that become available. You know, we have access to the internet on smart watches, on the, our refrigerators, you know, touch screens on our refrigerators, car dashboards, you know, all of these places where now people can be engaging with us or we can be engaging with them. Uh, because that's where they prefer to be and, you know, that's where they choose to consume our content. We need to do the best that we can to make it a good experience. And the ones that don't um, are going to miss tremendous opportunities because at this point, consumers really expect a good experience no matter what device they're on. And they will punish the people that, that, that don't just by not coming back. And Google has, you know, shown this in a lot of studies that they said if you know, 74% of, well, yeah, it's like 74% of U.S. consumers 
will only wait three seconds for a page to load on their mobile phone before abandoning that experience. And if, it, if, if they abandon, it's 47% chance they will never come back again. So, I mean, that's 50%, almost 50%. Mm. They will never come back again if you give them a bad experience. So think about how many people their first impression of you is happening on a mobile device, right? I mean, so many of my, so much of my audience says, oh, the first time we heard of you was on, on a podcast. Well, okay, so someone's listening on a podcast from their phone, and at the end I'm saying, hey, you know, visit mobilemix.com slash, you know, 52 for the show notes and, you know, get this freebie giveaway or whatever. Um, they're most likely hitting that page from a phone. And, I mean, I have about 32 to 35% of all of my traffic to my site comes from a mobile phone. And for you, for those of you listening, if you check, uh, you know, your Google analytics, I will, I will bet that most of you will see 20, at least 20 to 25% of your, tr- of your traffic is happening on a mobile device. So, you know, what's that experience like for those people? And you really have to just understand that, you know, you need to kind of put some work in now to, to make it a good one. Right. Uh, all right. So I just pulled up your site and you, I like this strategy, but can you walk us through it? It looks like you've got a lead pages, Yep. Uh, landing page for your home, right? So you're, you're doing a redirect there to the yeah, so welcome. Yep, that's a welcome gate. So that shows up to people that um, it only shows up to you. Like if you skip that now, you won't see it, I think, for another 60 days or something like that. Right. Um, but, you know, if you've already opted in, uh, you won't see that. Right. Um, you know, you'll just go right to the home page. So, I mean, th- that's great because, you know, obviously – there's a, a freebie giveaway, but you know, on the show notes, you know, when you do go to like slash the number of an episode, um, you know, you'll go right to the show notes and you'll be able to kind of consume that content. Surprisingly, a lot of people, uh, I forget the exact percentage, but it, it was surprising to me how many people actually listen to the podcast from the mobile webpage. Like they're not doing it in iTunes. They're not doing it in some app. Um, they're not doing it on their computer. It's like they get to that mobile webpage and then they click play right on that, on that page, which, you know, they have to keep that page open, you know, in order for that to continue playing. So I thought, I thought that was interesting, but you know, that's just how people are choosing to consume the content. So, uh, I use a responsive WordPress theme right now, uh, actually going through a a custom redesign at the moment. Um, but responsive design is, is a great solution for, online marketers, content marketers, content-based sites. And very simply, it is um, using kind of modern web technologies to detect the resolution of the screen that's trying to access uh, your site. And based on that, usually people will design three different, three or four different breakpoints. So, you know, desktop, laptop, tablet, smartphone, and it'll just adjust the layout of the site um, so in some cases, very, very slightly so that it looks really, really nice on a phone. That may mean, you know, your 15 navigational buttons across the top roll into one drop down menu um, or something like that. So, you know, you're definitely limited by some of the themes that are out there. A lot of themes are now building responsive. So, you know, the, the quickest way is to, you know, use one of these themes or work with, you know, a custom developer or a custom or developer to do a custom development. Um, to get a like a very nice responsive site, right? Uh, so, so lead pages that that's a a trick or a tip up your sleeve. Uh, but you are doing, you know, you got the mobile mix. Are you are you helping people with a little bit of everything, like SMS messaging? Are you helping them with social media? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, where where's your focus? Yeah. So me personally, my audience, um, consists of small business owners and, um, like small local marketers. So, you know, like they have their own agency or they're their own consultant trying to sell services to restaurants, dentists, salons, you know, small to medium sized local businesses. So with that being said, I really do focus on, I focus on mobile web, text message, marketing, um, email, and and social to some degree, just just out of the fact that social is driving traffic to your site, um, and really search actually. So local search is is really big um, from a mobile standpoint. You know, I think it's like fifty percent of all mobile local all mobile search has local intent. So that means they're looking for something in and around their area. So um, th- those are kind of the, the core foundations that I that I I talk about on the site. But I mean. I have a, a you know 107 episodes of the podcast so far, so we talk about we talk about everything. We talk about consumption behavior. We talk about 
you know, Facebook specifically. We talk about Instagram, talk about SMS, email, I mean, every, everything. So mobile touches so many things that it gives me a lot of opportunity to, to kind of spread a little bit beyond mobile, but how mobile is impacting that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but from like a, a, from a training perspective, though, I really do hone in on mobile web, SMS, which is text message marketing, um, email, and kind of the search part of that. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm kind of allergic to technology. Or do you think it's time for me to upgrade from my Palm Pilot? <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't think they're still supporting that, though, are they? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I know some people. They kind of they, they have stopped <laughs> answering my calls, so I may have to look into that. Uh, the phone redirects to, like, Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what can people do with SMS? Uh, what are some some um, good and bad, you know, what are some mistakes you're seeing people make? Uh, what are some things they need to get right uh, in mobile and text message marketing? Yeah. So um, the things that people make the mistake about is um, treating it exactly like email um, and, you know, including too much information, trying to include too much information. I mean, with SMS, you're limited to 160 characters. So very similar to a tweet. So it's very short, snippets of information um, that are really, really great for time sensitive information. So, you know, if you have an event on a Friday, you know, you might send out an email promoting that event on Monday or Tuesday, but the text message probably shouldn't go out to remind people until maybe Friday, maybe Friday afternoon, if it's like an evening event, Um, because 90% of text messages will be read within three minutes. So um, if you send out that message on Monday, it's going to be way long forgotten before you even get to that event on Friday. Um, so consistency and, um, frequency, uh, are definitely, um, are, are things that people I think make mistakes on, you know, just like when you have an email list, you kind of want to nurture them. You know, you want to make sure that they hear from you, you know, at least once a week, uh, text messaging is the same thing, but really no more than once or twice a week. Um, where I think you can get away with that sometimes with email, so you can't really be messaging them too much again because you are just you are going to break through all clutter, all noise um, that exists. So there needs to be high value, a really clear call to action that usually is capitalizing on some sort of time sensitivity, exclusivity, um, or something like that. Um, so I, I see it really, really great with um, from a loyalty perspective, uh, announcing new products or services early. So. Um, you know, you have, uh, anyone that's opted into your SMS list, you should treat them, you know, like they're, like they're very special, more special than your email subscribers. You know, they're letting you have access to the most personal device that they own. So if you could give them, you know, give them 12 hours ahead of time notice than anything else that, you know, other than anyone else you're talking to. So they kind of get that ex- exclusivity of, Hey, as a VIP on this list, I'm always going to find out about these things first. Whether it's a webinar, whether it's you know a sale, um, you can bring your SMS subscribers into your store early if you have a brick and mortar location. Um, so those sorts of action oriented messages, like "Hey, join now," you're getting this early bird access, works really really well. Um, and also, like say you have like a restaurant and you're like you know trying to promote happy hour at three o'clock, you send a message that says, "Hey, you know, bring this message and show it." during happy hour and you'll get, you know, one drink free on us or something like that when you buy one. So those sorts of like mobile coupon type initiatives are super powerful. They convert 10 X that of, you know, a standard coupon. So, um, outside of that fact that you're saving money from having to print coupons and do that, that whole thing, um, it could be really, really efficient for a small business. I wish you'd have told me this before I was I sent a big tweet out, a, a SMS message out there by, you know, showing my macaroni and cheese I was having for dinner and like got all these complaints, man. What, couldn't you save me from that? I could have. Yeah. yeah. I could have. Uh, now you tell me. All right. But, but if people subscribed to that to get a behind the scenes look of your life, then they're getting exactly what they opted in for. So making sure that what people opted in to receive is what you're delivering them is really important. You know, being very clear and transparent with what are you going to get by being on this list? Um, Because 
frankly, the, the guidelines and regulations around text messaging have um, dramatically changed in, even in the last six months. And, you know, there's, there's like federal organizations that are now, that are now a part of this and auditing, you know, SMS campaigns. So like having the clear disclaimers, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act now in, incorporates um, SMS. So you need to be sure that you're not violating that. So really, you know, having that clear, concise call to action where there's, there'd be no doubt in the consumer's mind as to what they're going to be receiving uh, is really, really important from a messaging standpoint. So how can people increase their opt-ins? Like let's say a restaurant, for instance, I've seen different things. I've seen uh, the keywords. Uh, People are telling me though, keywords are going down. You know, they're going back to a full uh, seven or or 10 digit, you know, number, you know, text the word, you know, tortilla or whatever to Mm -hmm. the full number. And they're seeing increased opt-ins, uh, you know, QR codes. I don't know. They seem like they were all the rage three years ago. And, <laughs> um, uh, and at least for me, I'm like, really? You got a QR code? I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, how, how can people increase their opt-ins? Yeah, well, so typically, you know, like you alluded to, the way people opt in in the first place, the the number one method is texting a keyword into a short code. Um, so a short code is like a five or six digit number. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the full 10 digit number, which is considered a long code. Um, there's a lot of debate around this. Um, it's way cheaper to do a long code, but you have a lot less flexibility uh, from a mar- as a marketer from a long code. And if you're generating any sort of significant volume, the wireless carriers will most likely shut you down if you're using a long code because those aren't provision numbers that are provisioned for SMS. So across the ca- wireless carrier networks. Um, but a lot of people that get in there, um, you know, providers that offer this. Um, they offer it because they know they're never going to reach critical mass in volume. And, um, you know, it's, it's very inexpensive for them getting short codes. Um, you know, if you want like a dedicated short code is very, very expensive. So barriers to entry are really, really high, especially for a small business. Um, you know, you're looking at, you know, anywhere from 500 to a thousand bucks a month just for the short code. Um, and you pay for that in three, six or 12 month increments. So going through a provider, that offers a shared short code is really beneficial, but with the short code. So, you know, like if you see like American idol or something where it's like text idol one to nine, 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 or whatever that number is. Um, that's a, the nine, nine, nine number is a, is a short code and you get the, the ability for two way interaction is much more efficient and your deliver deliverability rates are going to be much higher when you're using a short code. Um, long codes aren't necessarily guaranteed that the message is going to ever end up in the recipient's phone. Um, so to get people to opt in one very clear call to action, simple call to action, you know, text win to one, two, three, four, five, um, or, you know, join to one, two, three, four, five, and really have some sort of incentive, um, offering an incentive to get people to opt in is, is always the, always the best way to go about it. Incentive doesn't need to be monetary. Um, it can be access. It can be, you know, some sort of exclusivity. Um, so, you know, as a restaurant, you know, what I see is a lot of restaurants doing, um, you know, coupons, um, but they're doing coupons very strategically, at least the smart ones are. And this kind of goes, is going to take a step back for a second and say, well, why are you doing this? Um, just like anything you're doing with marketing, like why would you be using this, this marketing channel and how is it aligned with your business goals? And is it solving any sort of problem in your business? So if you go talk to a restaurant, I will guarantee you, if you ask them, what is their top three biggest problems? One of those will be having this one slow day a week. There's probably one or two days a week that are so slow for them that they actually really suffer. Like those days each week contribute to like their biggest loss because they still have to keep the doors open. They still have to pay employees. They still have to pay all the bills and utilities and they don't have enough customers coming in. So if they can drive customers into the establishment on a slow day, each additional customer that comes in has that higher margin, right? Like there's that marginal benefit of each of those customers is it makes each customer way more valuable because they're getting either closer to breaking even or even, you know, crossing over that threshold and making it profitable. So I would focus as a restaurant, 
100% on getting everyone to opt into your list by giving something amazing away, whether it's, you know, a free appetizer when you join the list um, or whatever, give away a $10 coupon just to get them in there and then use your ongoing messaging to drive offers that will drive them to the establishment on the slow days. Um, and that's your, that's, that's your only strategy. Like that's like what you focus on for the first three to six months and you will see results and it'll actually help you end up helping your bottom line. So make sure it ties to a strategy, make sure it ties to your business goals and objectives. Um, but unfortunately some sort of incentive is the best way to get someone in. Um, monetary is great, but it doesn't have to be monetary, but some incentive is definitely great to get people to opt in. Okay. So, so like the, it's a brick and mortar. It's a restaurant kind of example. What about what about a website? I mean, if I hit your website, are are you going to try to drive me you know, quickly to SMS? Uh, are you are you split testing things? Are you going are you going email first if they hit the website? How does somebody know uh, how how to pull them in? Well, I mean. You could, you would know if they're coming from a mobile, a mobile phone or on a desktop. And you, I mean, you could, I'm not, I'm not doing this right now, but it, it could be something I do. Um, you know how you have like the pop-ups, a lot of sites, you see a pop-up to get them to opt into your email. Yep. Well, if they're on a mobile phone, you'd be able to detect that they're on a mobile phone. And instead of an email opt-in, it could be an SMS opt-in. I like using it. Um, I have actually used it in a little while, but I, I do like using it off my podcast. Um, you know, again, it's an audio, predominantly audio by, by nature. People are out there and about. And to say, you know, hey, to get in, uh, you know, get special alerts from me, you know, mobile tips and tips and tricks, text mixed, you know, to the short code. And that's a pretty fairly easy call to action to remember versus going to a URL. Um, and, you know, you could do that. And then you could send out different types of things. I mean, I could promote the podcast through that if that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, that when I used to, when I was doing it for a while, um, the, you'd get a, a video back. So you'd get a, an MMS, which is a multimedia message. And there'd be a quick video saying, hey, thanks so much for joining. Click the link below this video and opt in to get my free mobile marketing toolkit. So the text message alerts were you know, one sort of communication that I would share, but I was driving them with that text message to a mobile optimized landing page using lead pages to get them to opt in to eat to, to my email. So you could do, you know, those sorts of things too. So you can include links in your text messages. So you could send a, a text message out with a link to a blog post, to a, an exclusive sales page, to, you know, a, a registration for a webinar. I've used SMS to promote webinars before. Um, and I you know, kind of use that exclusivity, early access um, type deal. And this was early on. I remember the I did a case study somewhere about this. Um, I had about, I think like there was only like 250 people on the list at the time. And I had 35% conversion from that list signing up to register for the webinar. And it, all those registrations came within like the first 20 minutes. Nice. So, you know, like, to go out there and say, hey, you are my VIPs. You're going to hear about everything first because I know how fast this is going to hit you. So, hey, check it out. I'm doing this webinar. I only have, you know, 500 slots, you know, depending on if you're using like GoToWebinar or something. And, you know, I want you guys to know about this first because you are my VIP. So sign up now. There's an email going out tomorrow about this. Make sure you get your seat registered. Uh, You know, so just that sort of exclusivity you could do. Um, You could do that with products. Um, You could do that with... um, you know, speaking arrangements. You can use SMS while you're speaking to capture an email. I know that, you know, you obviously work with Infusionsoft, so they have plugins that um, are integrations where you can have someone just text in an email address and, you know, that gets them into your, you know, your email sequence. Um, So a lot of different ways that we can be, we could be using it. Right. Very cool. How are you liking this, um, that survey to, what is it, survey to sale? Is that what? Survey to sale? Yeah, actually, um, so definitely get tons of great feedback. You know, like everyone that that um, you know has completed it. You know, I have a couple open ended questions. I think I might need to add a few more like radio button type questions just for qu- quicker engagement. Right. But I mean, the feedback that I've gotten is great. Um, I definitely definitely has driven sales. That's for sure because they see the time sensitivity of. Um, you know, of the offer, it's like, you know, this, this offer is going to go away and I think it's like 10 minutes or something. Right. So it adds some urgency. Uh, my, my biggest challenge there, 
uh, and 100% transparency is I have like my, my audience is so niche. Like I don't have like massive amounts of traffic that I'm getting like new traffic all the time. That's really seen it. So like the the sales are pretty flat line right now, but I actually do have people going in and filling out the survey, but then end up not buying the product. So I'm still using that feedback as, you know, I'm changing my sales copy um, because they're using different language. So hmm, maybe that's why it's not resonating because I'm not even using the same words that they're using. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, those, that level of insight, I think, is really, really great. Yeah. I, know, I know John Lee Dumas crushes it with it. Yeah. And uh, I saw it on his side, and but people are going to have to go visit mobilemix.com to see what we're talking about. Yeah. But uh, it's there on the bottom right, uh, and that's to get your SMS uh, marketing handbook. Mm-hmm. So I see you are speaking at the podcast movement August 16th, 17th in Dallas. I am, yeah. Congratulations on that. I'll, uh, Thanks. Well, are you going to be there? Uh, I am going to attend. Uh, I'm talking, nice, nice. talking with Dan Franks about uh, speaking as well. Awesome. Um, so we'll see how wise he is, you know, and, and, you know, cause he's crazy if he has me on as a guest. I mean, that would be insane. Do <laughs> crazy, not go to the crazy event. smart, crazy smart. Do not go to the event. If he picks me, you know, like, like, like Groucho Marx said, I will not be the member of a club that will have me as a member. You know, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, that's exciting. What are, what are you doing? Uh, going back to the podcast, yeah. how did you build that puppy up? I mean, there's a lot, you know, obviously John Lee Dumas has a lot of, uh, uh, making a lot of noise out there. Pat Flynn's been around, uh, killing it, but it's a lot of work. There's right? a lot of work. And, and I mean, for those and two I have guys, two, and I have two podcasts. <laughs> yeah, you've got two. So you've got, uh, what is, oh, you got the mobile mix podcast. And then what's yeah, the, and you leaving got, corporate is the second one. What is it? Leaving corporate. Oh, that's right. What is the uh, – I saw one here, TT021. What is TT? Uh, that's, a, that's just a segment of Mobile Mix. So oh. I, I, do a, I do a weekly segment called Take Down Tuesdays. Take down, and it's, that's right. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's just like a review of a, spe- a specific campaign that I see and experience from my phone. So I kind of just review it really quick. Gotcha. Yeah, for a second there, I thought you had three podcasts. Oh, yeah, like, no, no, brief. <laughs> uh, Sometimes it feels like it, though. <laughs> So, I mean, we, we see these, these big guys killing it. We see their income reports, you know, 50000 a 100000 a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some people get excited. Uh, some people probably get overwhelmed. Uh, most people are not going to make fifty or $100,000 a month podcasting. Majority of people won't. <laughs> so uh, Cliff Ravenscraft, uh, you know, he came on the show. He's very upfront and honest. He talks about, you know, hard work. He just this week, I don't know if you heard it. Uh, his response to a dude that that he wrote a blog post why people should not start a podcast. Mm-hmm. Have you seen? I, I, no, I didn't. But that sounds awesome. What did uh, what did what did it say? Oh, go go check it out. Well, this guy, I mean, and it's funny. He he got found kind of through some nit. He does some kind of niche marketing and and Pat Flynn had kind of talked about him and and but the guy is a sporadic podcaster. Right in two years, basically, he's averaged about one podcast every other week. Mm. Um, at, at most, and he would go months without doing any. And so Cliff, Cliff went for an hour and fifty-two minutes, no, <laughs> no music, no sponsor, no nothing. He says, "Hey," and and he's like, "I can't believe I'm going this long." He says, I, "And but he wanted to show that it is simple. You don't need to let music and technology things like that hold you back. Just mm-hmm. start talking, right? Talk about something that you're passionate about." But he he went on for a long time. Uh, but it was, it was cool the way he broke it down and said, look, you know, this guy had actually gotten very good traffic, uh, and he's had some long-term clients, but he just didn't like doing it. He, he yeah, was yeah. a self-professed introvert, kind of an engineer type. He's more comfortable with spreadsheets. Uh, he did not like scheduling, did not like doing the, the interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and Cliff was saying, don't do interviews, do a solo show, yada, yada. But I mean, it was fantastic, but I mean, Cliff doesn't hold anything back. He said, look, he, he worked a long time yeah. uh, before he built up um, the type of revenue he's doing now. And it's not, I mean, his podcast is just a marketing vehicle, you know, right? Um, it's a, it's a authority builder. It's people getting comfortable with him, uh, you know, starting to know, like, and trust him, you know, like just, I mean, the same thing with, with Pat and John, you know, they just have a higher cadence, like, well, at least with ask Pat, um, and you know, the, the downloads obviously, but I can tell you that like most people, and I was just talking to John about this other, the other day, there is so much more competition now than there was, you know, 
when John started. And I know, I know this because I just launched Leaving Corporate, and it's only been in iTunes for three weeks. And the same week that I launched, there were James Altucher launched, Tim Ferriss launched, um, this guy Bill Murphy, who's awesome with Forever Jobless, launched Screw the Nine to Five, which you know both of those two I just said have very similar kind of language than what my what my podcast talks about. Um, you know, Jeff Goings launched like, so there's only, I think like 20 slots in new and noteworthy. And I just named like eight podcasts. Like, I mean, you have so much more competition now and you're competing against a lot of people that already have big audiences. And quite frankly, are talking about a lot of the same things that we're all talking about. You know, there's, uh, I think I heard at new media expo, um, maybe it was social media marketing world. Cliff said something like, you know, we don't, I'm not sure we really need more podcasts interviewing entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, but if you do, make sure it's somehow unique because you, know, you can't just interview entrepreneurs and then interview all the same entrepreneurs that everybody else is interviewing and have no, no unique spin on it, which is sort of kind of one of the things that I'm trying to make sure that I don't get stuck doing because you know, my show interviews entrepreneurs, but I'm focusing on what they did while they were still in corporate so that they could leave corporate, which mm -hmm. for me, I didn't, I, I didn't hear anyone talking about at least deeply enough. And that was the question that I was asking myself. Like, how did John go six months recording you know, entrepreneur on fire without making any money. Oh, he had like $140,000 in savings. That makes sense. How did Amy Porterfield leave working with Tony Robbins to start her own business? Oh, she had two paying consulting clients that were enough to pay her bills yep. and long and signed like year long contracts. So she knew she had that money for a year. Like all these people did these things that, you know, I wasn't getting the answers to, which is why I started the podcast. But I think you know, to the the early part of this question, you asked about, um, you know, people getting started thinking that, you know, this is going to be like a 40K a month thing just because they're going to get sponsorship. One, I don't think it's going to be that easy um, because it's not because there's more competition. But most of us, like the podcasts that are going to be successful are going to be really, really niche, um, I think, moving forward. And like Mobile Mix is a perfect example. I don't get, I don't get like even 5,000 downloads a day or anything like that. Like nowhere close. I don't even, I get like maybe like 500 to a thousand downloads a day, maybe on a good day. Mm -hmm. And I have two, and I have two episodes a week since mobile mixed was in new and noteworthy when I launched. Um, I haven't even been in the top 200, but it's been a marketing channel for me. A lot of people find me through my podcast, so it's a lead generator. Um, and I monetize through my own products and services. So uh, I think people need to be thinking more along the lines of how can my podcast deliver value, create a relationship with, with the audience that I have, and convert that audience into my own, my own products and or maybe even affiliate products, you know, if that's what you're working on. But that's going to be the way that most podcasters are going to turn this into a business. And, you know, it's not going to be getting, you know, sponsorship from, you know, 99 designs, like, you know, some of the, the top within 0.01% of podcasters actually get. Right. So uh, that's, that's my fear is people that just jump in thinking that like, oh, my topic is so, so going to be so big. Which, yeah, it could be, but the odds are definitely against you. Um, but it is still, like, like Cliff says, a great way to you know, connect and engage with your audience and drive sales of your own products. Right. So that's, how, that's my approach. My approach isn't like huge sponsorship dollars. Um, I actually had a sponsor for Mobile Mixed, did like a three-month program, but then they got acquired so that, um, that program ended. Uh, I'm actually finalizing a deal right now to do another sponsorship for Mobile Mixed, more of like a branding play. You know, they want to get out there and get their name out there and they like my audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we negotiated a deal that worked for, worked for the both of us. Um, and, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, but, you know, I'm open to experiment with it. Experiment with it. My audience hasn't said that they don't like it. So, you know, I'm going to keep trying things, it's, but it's not going to be, you know, bringing home $20,000 a month. That's for sure. Right. I hear you. Well, good. I mean, thanks for sharing that because I, I try to get down to the to the brass tacks as well. I mean, there's too many yeah. pie in the sky things out there, and I'm like, okay, no, back up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, what would you say your podcast does for you? Uh, man, it does a lot. It it mm -hmm. you know it gives me access to people. First of all, like mm -hmm. having a conversation like this with you. I mean, I mm -hmm. I ask the questions that I sincerely have. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Likewise, uh, yeah. 
you know, so I, I get insight. Uh, I'm building these connections, but it, it, it brings traffic to the site. I mean, my sales are, are up, but you know, I, I've, I had an established business, you know, mm-hmm. I've, um, I've had the sales with since 2006, you know, and I've right, been yeah. doing infusion soft sales and support since 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was already on my own making money when I launched this. So it's just one more medium, um, to another channel to bring business, to bring traffic, uh, to bring validity, uh, to my business and myself. Uh, and you know, and I like doing it and, you know, and like you're saying, I, I recognize how the, the industry is changing. I'm a writer, right? I, I can write a thousand or 2000 word blog post. Mm-hmm. Uh, but less and less people want to see that, but it is still great for SEO, you know, and I still do that because then I'll pull those out and those become webinar topics or even eventually books. Like I just came out with last November, nice. uh, was, you know, a, a combination of, of 79 of my stories going back eight years. So, yeah. I mean, it, it all comes together, you know, and, uh, but just having the podcast gives us a lot more credibility, I think, certainly in, in reaching yeah. out to people, uh, and getting, I'd say it got me my speak, a lot of my speaking gigs, you know, yeah. the ability to be like, look, I have over a hundred episodes and I was featured on, you know, smart passive income, social media examiner. I mean, I was on Pat Flynn's podcast as a guest and then Mike Stelzner reached out to him and said, Hey, can you introduce me to Greg? I want him on my show. So I went on, went on his show. Then he was like, Hey, will you speak at social media success summit, their virtual success, their virtual conference did that. And he's like, Hey, will you come to social media marketing world? I'm like I would, that would have never happened if I had never started podcasting, you know, yeah. like all of those doors open, like you said. Um, one thing you did mention, though, that I want to I want to add to is, um, you know, you said you're a writer, um, and uh, what th- one thing I'm seeing that I, that I've been doing, and you know, I learned this from uh, Jason and Jeremy from Internet Business Mastery, is doing an audio blog. So, you know, if you write a blog post, if you are that writer and you don't know what podcast you know content is inside of you, well, just start recording yourself reading your podcast and. Put an audio blog into iTunes. Um, they actually just released a separate feed into iTunes called Internet Business Mastery Audio Blog, and you know it does extremely, extremely well. They shared numbers that I actually I wrote a blog post called "How to Increase Your Blog's Reach by Two Thousand Percent," and they shared numbers, and I shared some numbers of um, taking the exact same content that I wrote, recording myself reading it, releasing it into my podcast feed. And seeing like dramatic numbers, like they had a blog post that would receive, you know, 20, 2,700 unique page visits and the, the same content audio got 28,000 downloads, like unique downloads. So, um, like that's that increased reach just because there are going to be some people out there that aren't going to read. They'd like to, they'd like to listen and that's their preferred, um, you know, their, their preferred media format. So right. don't think you need to go and create this whole separate set of content because you could just record yourself reading stuff that you had written right. and start, start releasing that. And that'll be a whole new audience that you could be tapping into. So would you recommend somebody have a separate podcast for that? Or like, like with your uh, Take Down Tuesday, is that an entirely mm-hmm. separate podcast or do you no. feed it through your existing podcast? Um, feed it through my existing and, and there is kind of a question that you need to ask yourself, um, as to that will lead you in the right direction, I think. So like you look at Jason and Jeremy, um, they, they were releasing, um, well, they, one, they had, they have tons of episodes and they don't have a, sure. an issue with getting a lot of downloads each episode cause they have a huge audience. Um, so for someone like me, it actually benefits me and my rankings in iTunes if I release them in the same feed because iTunes sees more content being added more frequently, um, which definitely helps your rankings because iTunes looks at the last 48 hours mm-hmm. um, is kind of where they're looking at subscriptions, downloads, ratings and reviews, all that stuff within the last 48 hours. So if you would typically only had one episode a week, but your content is or your topic is super niche, like mine being mobile, um, adding another episode, which even if it is just the audio blog to that feed could be beneficial for you from overall download numbers. If you do want to go, go end up gaining sponsorship um, and also just getting more visibility in iTunes. 
But if you do have a separate audience or like, or sorry, large audience, um, I do think it could be beneficial for you to have it as a separate thing because then you have two episodes in iTunes or two shows in iTunes um, and Stitcher and all the other places that you post, um, which also creates more visibility. Um, And I guess the third thing would be how often are you writing? So, you know, Jeremy and Jason do a blog post a week and a podcast a week. You know, if you're a blogger and you have, we're typically doing three a week, you know, and then you also had a podcast, it might make sense to have them separate just because there's going to be so much more audio blog content than a blog than, than your podcast episode. So I think if you're going for downloads, pure downloads, you'd want them in the same feed. Um, but if you already have a large audience, I'd say it might benefit you to have them separate. Gotcha. Very cool. I may have to try that, man. I think you should, man. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I, I've pondered it for a while. And a, a guy that I follow, uh, I've known for years and years, over 10, 11 years, uh, Roy Williams out in Austin has the Wizard of Ads, but he has the Monday Morning Memo. And he um, he writes it every week. He's written it nonstop without fail for something crazy, 18 years, 20 years, wow. something uh, but he reads it as well, so you can you can get the audio right there on or read it. And um, I don't think he has a podcast, so he's just always done it that way. Yeah. Um, so may have to get into that. Once Try upon that. a time, there was a salesman. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I can do that. Yeah, you could. You you have the great voice for it too. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, are you hitting on me? Don't no. Uh, you have good taste, but hey. All right. Um, mm-hmm. All right, man. So people can find you. We mentioned mobilemixed.com, dot com, but you yep. you did not give us your short code. Lay it on us. My short code. Your uh, your, your your keyword. You had mentioned uh, you you started. Oh, it, you oh I'm us. not I'm not running that right now, so I can't give that out. Ah, uh, okay. That's why you didn't. Yeah. I was like, man, come yeah. on, give it to us. Yeah, all yeah. right. Well, when you do, yeah, let yeah. me know, and we'll yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll promote it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm setting up on a new system, so I'll be doing some of the multimedia messaging um, with some little video and audio clips. Cool. Uh, but I was uh, the company that got acquired was the one that was powering it, so I'm, they're going through some transitional stuff. So I have, I had to, I have to pause all that. Very cool. Well, um, do me a favor. I uh, so my interview with John comes out at the end of May. Okay. Um, shoot, shoot Pat a message and say, how come you haven't had my boy Wes on? Oh, yeah. I'll reach out to Pat. I've been lobbying him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what it takes. Well, yeah, I, I need to get you on uh, leaving corporate as well. All right. Hey, I did it, brother. I did I know. it for reals. I know. I'm, I want to hear the story. We need to share the story. All right. Let me know, man. All right. We'll get it scheduled. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time, Mr. Greg. Uh, everybody, please visit mobilemixed.com. Check out uh, his SMS marketing handbook. Um, and lobby Dan Frank. Say, we want Wes. Uh, <laughs> Dallas, the podcast movement, August 16th to 17th. It will look, just accept it. It will be hot. You will land. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You will get off the airplane and you will say, it's hot. It's really hot. But you know what? Air conditioning is affordable. Uh, so it's on everywhere. I think they're going to put a dome over the Dallas Fort Worth area and just have <laughs> air conditioning. Uh, the beers are priced uh, nicely. So just come on out and. Um, Get on the podcast movement and hang out with Greg and me. How's that? I love it. All right. I'm excited to see you. All right, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. All right, man. Have a great day. You too. Do you notice a trend in these successful entrepreneurs uh, in that all of them really had their finances under control uh, or they did not become successful until they did? But, you know, guys like Cliff Ravenscraft, I mentioned before, you know, they, they got their finances squared away. They lived under their means, got out of debt so then they could afford to make that launch. You know, John Lee Dumas uh, had built up a nice nest egg as well. He was able to go six months Uh, building his podcast before he launched. So get your finances under control. And I love what he talked about when he had the realization, you know, Greg did about his home. Uh, I've invested in real estate for years. Used to have a real estate license in Texas, built a few houses, uh, made some money, lost some money, uh, rehab houses, uh, own an apartment complex. And I learned early on that your house really is not your biggest asset. Assets are things that throw off money with no maintenance, no effort whatsoever. A house is really just a place to hang your stuff and to sleep. Sure, you make some memories. It does become a home, 
But regardless, you've got to pay taxes. You've got to pay utilities. Uh, you've got to put a new roof on that thing. You've got to mow the grass. You know, you've got to put a fresh coat of paint, you know, from time to time. There's all types of things that require that house uh, to be maintained for the upkeep. So you really have to look at it as just a place to lay your head. You know, on a bank's P&L statement, profit and loss, it is shown that outstanding note that you owe, that balance, is actually shown as a receivable. It's shown as an asset to them because money is coming into them, which means it's a liability to you. So if you're in a housing situation, uh, please listen to this podcast. Take uh, to heart what Greg did, and I encourage you to do the same thing. You know, if you're losing sleep over your home, get rid of it. But anyway, this is not a real estate show. Um, Greg had some great advice in there. It's fantastic if your employer supports uh, your passion. If they don't, then you still owe it to yourself to follow your dreams uh, on nights and weekends, uh, whatever it takes to build that foundation so you can launch on your own. Um, as always, I appreciate you listening to this podcast. Uh, if you would mind taking a few seconds, visit thesalespodcast.com. Leave a five-star review. That would be fantastic. Uh, leave some comments on the blog as well, thesaleswhisper.com. And if you want to get better at sales, visit 30daysalesgrowth.com. Enter promo code podcast and get $30 off. As always, remember to sell different. <laughs>